We're doing well. How are you? No technical issues this Sunday, right? I'm trying out a brand new phone today. Ooh, so, we'll so I'm about to. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah. Stevens United Methodist Church. We're thrilled that you could join us online this morning and thrilled that you could be here in person. Uh, we have several announcements uh, we're going to be making today. Uh, the first is that today is the final day of our 2024 stewardship campaign, living our vision and growing together. And so what we've been doing is talking about how we as a church can move into the future, continuing the ministries that we've done in the past, but also preparing ourselves for new possibilities. And so during this service today, you will be given a moment to fill out your pledge cards. I know some of you have probably already done it, and that's okay. But uh, we're going to uh, fill those out. And then during the singing of a song that was written uh, in honor of our church, I thought she was a member of us. I found out she wasn't, but she came here for a while. Teresa Morton uh, wrote a special song called We Are, uh, and it's all about St. Stephen's. And so we're going to sing that and bring it forward. It should be an insert in your bulletin, so make sure uh, that you're prepared at that time. Sat Sunday Night Live is starting up again on November 5th from 4 to 6 p.m., and Jen needs all the volunteers she can get. She is looking hard for volunteers, so if you're interested, uh, I think she probably got some last week, but she's still looking for more. So if you're ready to volunteer and work with our children, uh, you need to see Jen. Also next Sunday, November 5th, is our All Saints Sunday service. It's a time when we honor all of those uh, saints who have passed in the last year or those saints who have meant so much to us in our lives. And we're going to honor them, and we invite you to fill out one of the ribbons with their name on it and, and put it on the tent and nebulum uh, out in the loggia. Uh, and next week, we're going to bring those names in. So, uh, Also, if you filled out a form for your stewardship of life, uh, but you didn't turn it in yet, uh, there is still time. I was laughing because last week Amy Prince said, I'm going to take it with me, and I looked down and said, that's all right, leave it here, I'll fill it out for you. <laughs> and she quickly grabbed it and said, no, that's okay, Patrick. You know, so we are still accepting them, so make sure that you get that turned in. Uh, also, this is a great sadness, but due to the weather, Trunk or Treat and the, and the Chili Cook-Off have been canceled for tonight. Uh, we really thought about doing it, uh, but it's just, we know families aren't going to be coming out in this weather. So that event has been canceled. Um, however, we will be looking for another uh, event for uh, the youth to do as a fundraiser. 
Also next Sunday, roundtable discussion is going to be starting up. Uh, our speaker, Dr. Carla Pratt, uh, was supposed to be with us for our roundtable discussion, was unable to be here due to a sickness, but she is coming next Sunday during the Sunday school hour to hold a discussion with us on critical race theory. And so we really want to invite everyone to be a part of that discussion. We're going to ask all of our adult Sunday school classes and our youth if they would like to be a part of our, uh, and to meet in our community hall during the Sunday school hour uh, for that discussion. So it ought to be a good, great time. I don't know if Brent is here. Is Brent out in the lobby, out in the loggia? Okay, I just wanted to make an announcement real quick, because uh, I don't see him, but he uh, wanted me to let everybody know that uh, you know that we work with our refugees, and last week we got a grant from the Woodworth Estate for our work with the refugees for $39,000, uh, and so I think that is something really to applaud, and uh, we're very excited about that. Um, we would also ask that you fill out your registration booklets, hand them to the person next to you, and uh, move them down. Now, the one last announcement I have is that I made this announcement last week that we are changing the way we're going to do announcements. We're no longer going to do them in worship. Now, that doesn't mean that if you have an emergency that you can't stand up and make an announcement. But we're going to be putting a bulletin insert in that looks something like this. Patrick made this on his computer. Isn't he talented? <laughs> yeah, amazing what you know, cutting and pasting with Google can do. Uh, but so it might look something like this. However, Lauren's probably going to edit it some, so it might not look anything like this, and she's probably going to find where I have all my misspellings. But it's going to look like this. We encourage you to take it home, put it on your refrigerator. Look it through during worship so you know what's going to be happening in our church, okay? And for those of you who are joining us online, we're going to be posting these announcements online as well so that you'll know. So that's how it's going to work for a little while. We'll see how that goes. So we're glad you're here. We hope that today's worship fills you with joy and with enthusiasm. And now let us uh, take a moment as we prepare our hearts for worship. We come today with grateful hearts. Thank you, Jesus, for preparing the way for us. We come today carrying the burdens of the week. Thank you, Jesus, for preparing the way for us. We come today anxious about tomorrow's challenges, yet excited about the future possibilities. Thank you, Jesus, for preparing the place for us. Amen. Please join us in the hymn of the Green Book, number 3161, Gracious Prayer of Sea and of Land.
Porcupine usually was really kind of gentle, but when he got mad or he saw an enemy coming, he had these, what, these quills that he could stick out and cause a lot of pain. And so uh, Fox said, Porcupine, would you go up with Skunk, and if any bad creatures get past Skunk's smell, then would you stick them with your quills so that they'll leave Baby Turtle alone? And Porcupine said, sure. So Fox kept running and kept looking for something to help Baby Turtle turn over, and then all of a sudden, he ran into a spider's web under the tree, and he went, oh yeah. This is what will do it. And he said, Spider, would you come help Baby Turtle turn over? Could you maybe weave a really strong web that would help? And Spider said, sure. Now, I have to ride on your back because I don't run that fast. And Fox said, fine. So Fox took Spider back to Baby Turtle. And Spider wove a really strong web between two of the legs on one of Turtle's side. And while he was doing that, the sun came up, and so Eagle flew back. And when the strong web was between the Turtle's two legs, Eagle came down and got the end of the web and pulled, and Turtle flipped right over. And you know, clap. I got that. Yeah. <laughs> right yeah. So all the animals did clap. And the mom and dad turtle especially were really, really happy. And Fox said, some of us are fast and wise. Some of us build strong webs. Some of us encourage and tell good stories. We all have talents that we can share. And when everybody gives what they have, we can do amazing things. So Mr. and Mrs. Turtle had a big party to thank all the animals, and everybody sang and danced and laughed because music is a gift everybody has. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the gifts, for the talents that you've given to each one of us. Help us to know when to give them and when to ask other people to help, to share, to do the things as you would have them do. Amen. themselves. 
Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. The word of life for today. Thanks be to God. Now, many years ago, I want to tell you this little story. Many years ago, uh, when your DS, uh, your district superintendent asks you to do something, you do it, and you don't really ask a lot of questions, which can get you in trouble sometimes. And several years ago, uh, I had a district superintendent who said, how much God love for everybody in the district to go to this event? And so I said, of course I'll go. I was the only preacher in the whole district who went. And it was, a, and I can't even remember the, the name of the event, but it was something like Oklahoma Innovation. And it was all about, you know, the different ideas, the different things that are taking place in the state of Oklahoma and the world beyond. You know, new ideas, new understandings, new technologies. And not a whole lot do I remember about it except for one speaker because he told the story that I'm about to tell you. And this story was important because it reminded me that even in the midst of failure, as long as we don't get wrapped up in it, success can always come. And he told this story. He said in 1997, Apple Computer discontinued one of its biggest ventures into the first idea of sort of a Palm Pilot cell phone. You may remember this. It, it, it was the first time they had ever tried it. It was called the Apple Newton. And that took me a while. I was a little slow, and I was like, why did they call it Newton? And then I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But, so it, some of us couldn't catch on. But it was funny because it was their first idea at a handheld personal digital assistant. And they marketed it as this incredible, revolutionary new thing. Did anyone own a Newton? <laughs> Boy, can we give you a hard time there, Ivan. <laughs> you know, and it's funny because it was marketed as the, the personal digital assistant. This would change the way everybody in the business world worked. You know, nothing would ever be the same after this. And, and they put about $400 million into development and marketing of this, and it has some interesting features from what I understand. The first feature was uh, that it had a writing tool that you could use, and you could make notes for yourself on it and about the things that you wanted to get done. You could also, now while it wasn't a phone, from what I understand, you should probably be telling the story, Ivan, but while it wasn't a phone, you could talk to it, and it would send text messages out, sort of what Siri does today for us. And it was this idea that you could carry this around in your pocket. It would be a wonderful tool for use uh, in, in the world. And, you know, and it was so funny because they said, this is going to change the world. But from day one, the Newton was a disaster. The much anticipated release was marked by extremely high cost. My understanding is now I... I'm going to ask, did you really spend, because what I found is that they cost about $800. I bought one long after they stopped making them. Wow, so you actually, once they were already bad, you bought one. <laughs> hey, I, I've, got a, I've, got a, I've got a bridge in the desert or something. <laughs> but you know, it's funny because they, it was extremely expensive. $800 in the 90s was a lot of money. And it was also, they had problems with the writing tool. When you would try and write on it, you couldn't understand people's writings, so it would put different words down. Same thing when you tried to do the texting, it couldn't understand people's language. It was just a, a ridiculous thing. And my favorite part was, this is handheld. It'll fit in your pocket. It was like this big, folks. <laughs> and this guy who was doing the presentation, he had one. And he said it was a total and complete disaster. It, as I said in the first service, the only person whose pocket this would fit into was Andre the Giant. <laughs> yeah, it was that big. And I'm going, how is that going to fit in your pocket? He was telling this presenter was talking all about this. And he said, and you know, he said it would have been easy for Apple at that point to say, you know, this was a failure. We're not going to try anything new, anything innovative again. Yeah, and the company could, fake, could have just gone under right then and there. 
But in the face of the challenges before them, they discontinued it and they said, what do we want to do? What do we want to develop? And they really began working and working to create new things. And in 2007, they, they put out their first what? iPhone. How many of you have an iPhone? We're sending our message to you on an iPhone today. Yes, this came out in 2007. It was their next big product development. And it changed the world. In the face of challenges before them, New ideas develop. Now, how many of you are Samsung users or Galaxy? Uh, we're going to love y'all anyways. I have to tell you, do any of y'all have the, the one that flips open for a TV screen? Okay, because my brother-in-law, April's brother, bought one of those, and he was really excited, and he said, that's why we're superior, Patrick. He said, and now he's got a line that goes right down the middle of his TV screen. So, <laughs> so I give him a hard time about that. But it's funny. We look at our failures sometimes and we say, let's just quit. Let's just give up. Let's settle for where we're at. Let's stay in mediocrity. And we don't try new things. Apple kept working, kept changing. And when those challenges arose, they invested in their future. Instead of falling prey to status quo, apathy, and indifference. And here's the interesting thing about us as human beings. Sometimes we're faced with challenges too. We get caught up and we, we, we see these challenges before us and we just sort of say, no, I just can't do it. I don't want to risk. It's easier to stay where I'm at. Change is difficult. And it's easy for us to become very uncomfortable with the idea of change. As human beings, we find great comfort in what is known, what is familiar, what we recognize, that's where we like to be. It's just so much easier. But sometimes we are challenged to change. And change is viewed with skepticism and fear. <clears throat> when faced with change, we run from it, choosing instead to remain content with our place or even complacent in the face of challenges that arise. Growth is hard. Growth comes at a cost of discomfort. And sometimes having to choose the road less traveled is not an easy prospect for us. I was talking in the first service that change is difficult. And sometimes when churches need to change and grow and develop, like this one has, but I've been part of churches that have seen those obstacles in front of them, and they said, no, we're not going to do it. I was talking in the first service about, you know, crossing over the Rubicon. How many of you have heard that phrase? Okay, many of you have heard that phrase. Uh, talk to Rick, though, because Rick told me it was great. I got a history lesson from Rick earlier. He felt bad about it, but he should, because what I said is if this was the first time that Caesar had ever crossed over the Rubicon River, uh, that anybody had ever taken Amer uh, legions into Rome, I was wrong. It was Sulla? Sulla did it 30 years earlier, and it resulted... In a great war, a great civil war that lasted for about 10 years. And, and that plays into my sermon group, so I appreciate that. Because we can sit back and see how change can really create havoc. But sometimes great things can happen. And I have seen churches that have come to the Rubicon River. Unfortunately, they've crossed over it. And by the time they realize that they have, it's too late to change the direction. Caesar said, we're going to cross over and we're going to change things. We're going to do something new and different. Now, we could argue whether or not it was good or bad, but the fact of the matter is they crossed over. And sometimes we're challenged to cross over. Sometimes we're challenged to see new opportunities, even in the face of fear of the unknown. And today's scripture in today's scripture, Jesus confronts the fear the disciples are having. Now, you've heard this scripture many times before. But I'm betting that most of the time you hear it, it's at a funeral, isn't it? It's usually there. But I'm going to take a little different perspective on it and say that what's going on here is Jesus is challenging the disciples to lead. Maybe for the first time in their lives. And they're scared. Now, I have to tell you, when I was in seminary, I had a professor at Islip who called them the disciple dimwits. 
because they never got it. They were so slow. They were so, you know, they were just like single focus. And it's like, well, he's our guide, our mentor, our teacher, our friend. We'll just let him lead. And so Jesus is saying, the day's coming when I'm not going to be around. And you're going to have to lead. It's interesting, if you look at the scripture, if you go back to chapter 13, verse 33, he reveals to the disciples that he's going to be leaving them. He says, little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Now this church has practiced that well and done so for many, many years. And I know we'll continue. But this shakes those disciples to the very core. They're sitting here thinking, he's leaving? Well, who's going to lead? Can't we just wait here, along the side of the road, waiting for someone to tell us what to do? And Jesus is saying, no, you're going to have to lead. He's been their constant disciple. I mean, their constant leader, their constant teacher. And Peter is shaken up about this. And he says, I will give my very life to you. And yet Jesus still goes on. And in chapter 14, Jesus seeks to calm their fears. And he says these wonderful words, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God Believe also in me. Jesus is seeking to alleviate the fears that they have and challenges them to lead. But Thomas continues to argue. Argues with Jesus and says, we don't know where you're going. How can we follow? And Philip challenges saying, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. It's always this test. You know, always trying to challenge them to say, you know, well, Jesus, can't we strike a bargain? And Jesus is saying, there's no bargain. I'm leaving. You're going to have to lead. You see, the disciples, what all answers presented in advance. They want to know everything that's going to happen. They're uncomfortable with the unknown. Unsure if they have the gifts and the skills to bring Jesus' ministry to life without his leadership. But Jesus seeks to offer them reassurance that they have been given gifts to lead to forge new directions, and to develop the ministry of Christ in their own way. And he goes on, he says at verse 14, 13, at chapter 14, verse 13, he says, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Now what's remarkable is that we have all been in situations where there is failure, where we've tried new things and it didn't work. But we've always tried new things after that. We've said, let's forge ahead with a new idea and a new understanding. Let's not let that failure make us complacent. Let's not let that failure get us stuck in a rut. And we've tried new things. And so now, for the first time, the disciples are beginning to see what Jesus is talking about. They are feeling empowered feeling like they could see new possibilities for the ministry of Christ. And today, for us, as we conclude our stewardship campaign, living our vision and growing together, we are filled with a new sense of what we as a church can accomplish together in the ministry of Christ. Today, as we bring forth our pledges for the 2024 budget, we're beginning to see the, the possibilities that we might not have ever imagined. Now, last week, I got a fine line here. No, that's not it. Did you fill out a stewardship of life form? See, I can't even find one. There it is. Did you fill one of these out? Raise your hand if you filled one out. Okay, now, like I said, Amy wouldn't let me fill hers out. I was a little upset about that. So, but I'm going to tease Amy and say, did you bring it back to you today, Amy? Oh no! Okay, everybody, we gotta go to Amy's house and get her. So you know, but that's okay. You know, we all fill these out. And when you were filling out, when you were going around the community hall, was there a little bit of a sense of excitement about what your future might hold, what you might?
might be a part of. Maybe you were wondering about the different ministries you could be involved in. How you might be able to shape the ministries of St. Stephen's and our church. Maybe you're wanting to get excited and we're getting excited about working with our congregational care team. Maybe you felt a rush of enthusiasm or fear as you talked about working with our children and our youth. See, that can be a lot of fun. It can also be scary. Working with the youth is always scary because you never know what's going to happen. You might end up in a van that goes the wrong direction. <laughs> Don't trust your preacher driver. So, there's always new ministries coming up. Maybe you were thinking about working with our food and shelter program. And you signed up for that and thought about the new ways you could be involved in that. And today we talked about, we announced that we got this great grant for our refugee program. The incredible things our work with refugees can do. And maybe you want to be a part of that ministry. See, God has equipped each and every one of us with special gifts. Gifts that could be used to lead in ministry. And we don't need to fear what it means to be in ministry for Christ. Because whatever we do will be a success. We don't have to worry about whether or not something doesn't work because we have God behind us telling us, try something new. Work with hope. Work with joy. Work with love and affirmation. In a few minutes, you're going to be given the opportunity to fill out your 2024 pledge card, and then we're going to bring them up here and place them in the basket. While we're coming forward, we're going to be singing a hymn that was written by Teresa Morton uh, for this church. She wrote it in honor of this church. It's called We Are. But I want to read to you the first word, the first verse of this song. We are God's hands. We are God's feet. We are to welcome the stranger and friend. God's people we are. Within these walls all shall be loved. We are to do, we are to be, we are to love. This church has done that so well for so many years. You all have reached out with love and compassion to the Norman community and the world beyond it. As April and I, we, we met with her grandmother yesterday. We had lunch with her, and she was asking about the new church, and April and I laughed again and said, you won't believe it. They really love one another. <laughs> it's hard to believe. It's evident in this church. And now we have the opportunity to create new possibilities for this church, new ministries and new directions. So let us all continue to love. Let us be all. Let us welcome all. And let us give all we can to, to not only sustain the ministries, but to dream new dreams and create new visions for ourselves and for St. Stephen's and for the world beyond. Let us pray. Glorious God, we come to you today as a community of faith who for years and years have leaned on one another in love and support. And we have spread incredible ministries to this community and beyond. We think about all the people who would not have been fed had we not done our, our crop walk. Forty years now we've been doing that. We have so many incredible <clears throat> ministries that take place here within the walls of of this church and in the world beyond. And now we ask that as we come forward to bring our gifts, that you challenge us once again to dream new possibilities and new opportunities. For just as your Son, Jesus Christ, can give each and every one of us and, and empowered us to lead, let us now lead with our hearts, with our souls. Let us lead with compassion for all we encounter as we continue your son's ministry. In his holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Stand if you feel comfortable and join with
earlier, I'm going to invite us into a time of silent prayer. But before I do, if you're joining us online today, we and you have a prayer concern you would like uh, for us to pray for, we invite you to private message us and let us know what that is, or you can call our church office and let Lauren know, and we'll get that on our prayer chain. So, let us go to God in prayer. Creator God, we have so many rich and varied experiences in our lives. Experiences of joy, experiences of sorrow, experiences of laughter, and experiences of pain. We have experiences of disillusionment, and we have experiences of hope. And today all of those emotions run through us. And we remember those within our community who are experiencing great joy in their life. And we give you thanks for all those who are starting up with new beginnings and new understandings, new jobs and new, and new family members. We give you thanks for those who are experiencing a sense of wholeness and healing after a time of trouble. We give you thanks. But God, we also know that you have placed upon each of us a sacred yoke, a sacred responsibility to care for others. In the midst of our joy, help us to recognize those who are suffering. And help us to remember to pray for them and to work for them. So we remember, God, all of those on this day who are struggling with poor health, and we ask for your healing presence in their lives. Help us to reach out to them with love and compassion. For those who are starting new journeys and going in new directions, we pray God's blessings upon their travels. And God, we know that even in the midst of all that we're going through, there is even greater suffering in the world. We pray for all the people in Maine, in that community, and we ask for your healing presence in them. We pray for the victims, and we pray for their families. And God, we also pray for the perpetrator and for his family. And we ask that you bring healing to each and every one. For all those who are suffering in the wake of war and violence, we lift them up to you. And so, God, we pray for the people of the Ukraine. Help us not to turn away. Help us not to be distracted away from their suffering. Help us also to pray for all the Palestinian people who are going through such a terrible tragedy at this time. Help us to remember all those lives lost, the innocent that have fallen victims. And God, where there is suffering and oppression, help us to be your instruments of work in the world. Let us be a voice to those who have no voice. Let our actions speak volumes about our faith. And God, we thank you for giving us this sacred mission, this sacred responsibility. And help us each and every day to begin all of our thoughts and all of our actions in prayer, by praying the prayer that your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, O God of sky and God of earth, we honor your presence within us and beyond. As we may eat, we share your gifts of hope and compassion with all the life of earth. Give us, O God, forgiving hearts, allowing each other with humor and with grace May we grow beyond narrow needs to join in the spreading of a just and loving peace. You greet us here and everywhere in moments of oneness and spaces of delight. To all this we now say, Amen. Your song is our anthem and your dance our cosmic joy. 
Now, as we come forward, I want to invite everybody, as we come forward and sing We Are, I invite you to stand. And during this hymn, we invite you to come and to place your pledge for 2024 in the basket. And then we'll have a moment to consecrate those gifts. Let us all rise. She said, oh, there's so much. I said, well, we've been doing it the same way for 200 years. We're not changing now. You know? <laughs> and so we're going to go through uh, the, the words that we speak as part of, the, of being a membership. And so I invite you to turn to page 38 of your red hymnal and respond accordingly. And so, Susan, I'm gonna, I've got just a few questions to ask you. Uh, as a member of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to St. Stephen's United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, say I will. I will. Okay. As a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say I will. I will. Members of the household of God, I commend Susan to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. And now let us join together. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, that everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Susan, the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Welcome aboard. You're in trouble now. <laughs> This, this church will make you work. So, 
Uh, friends, I'm going to ask Susan to come to the back of the sanctuary with me so that you can all greet her. But now let us rise. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, as we go forth from this place, go with joy, go with grace, go with the peace of God in your hearts and souls. Go knowing that God has equipped each and every one of us with special gifts and special tools. And now let us use those in the world as we go forth in peace. Amen.